there we go and we kick off uh, with with uh, a presentation from Mary. Um, Mary is a former researcher in molecular genetics and virology, which I think is a, quite a hot topic at the moment. Um, turned research data management professional. Um, she advises on all aspects of research data management at the University of Glasgow, but has a particular interest in the intersection between RDM and ethics. Uh, in addition to her role in the research data management service, she has been a member of the School of Veteran Veterinary Medicine Ethics Committee for the last two years. Uh, Mary is singularly unqualified to work in information management. Uh, I would probably disagree with that. Uh, with a degree in molecular, um, can't speak this morning, I'm really sorry. Molecular bio biology and biochemistry and a PhD in molecular genetics, but she enjoys it anyway. And as someone with a degree in information science, I can, uh, can add that I don't feel qualified most of the time either. So I think this is just like, I think this might just be an imposter syndrome uh, profession. Um, right, I guess with that, I'll hand over to you, Mary, and you can kick it off with your presentation. Thank you. Can I just check that my screen is still showing? It's still showing, uh, but it's not yet in presentation. Mode. Yeah, that's fine. OK, so here we go. Let's see if this works. Yes. So um, when my team were asked to do this, the first thing we thought was we hadn't actually done very much that was interesting with DMP Online. We use it as an institution. We subscribe to it. But our implementation of it's been really basic. But we do have a related um, piece of work that we've done in the last couple of years that's proven to be very popular with our academics and interesting to other people that we've talked about um, talked to about it. So we decided to talk about this today instead. I hope that's OK with everyone. It should have relevance to anyone, I suspect, working in research in Europe and may also have points of interest for folk elsewhere in the world. So what I want to talk to today is about the intersection between data management planning GDPR and the ethics application process and how to make them work together. So a couple of years ago, my colleague Matt and I were speaking to academics at a conference in Glasgow about GDPR and the requirements. And we basically got the impression that a lot of academics that were extremely competent in their area of research were had their head in the sand over what they needed to do around GDPR and making the work compliant. They didn't know where to start. It felt too big a subject to even um, come to grips with. And as a consequence, they just hadn't engaged with it at all. And it occurred to us we could possibly do something to make this process simpler to navigate and also to make sure that um, having navigated the process, they didn't have to go back and redo elements of it. Simultaneously with this, we we were starting to see data sets coming through to our um, data management team for deposit in the institutional repository where the ethics was not really acceptable for long term retention of the data and for sharing of the data. It may be that there hadn't been consent for long term retention and sharing of the data or that there was contradictory elements in different parts of the ethics paperwork. So the consent form may be may say that the data would be retained, but the participant information sheet would say that data would be destroyed. And it wasn't clear which elements of the data they were talking about. So we thought if we could also improve that aspect of um, planning at the start of a project, we'd make deposit of data easier at the end of the project. So um, we got together with colleagues from our data protection office, that's um, Stacey Harper and Joanna King, and Georgina Wardle, who is head of the University Ethics Committee at the University of Glasgow, um, to discuss drafting a project initiation workflow that would take researchers right from the start of a new project through all the processes that they would need um, and get them to the final point, which was a completed ethics application with everything in place. So um, this image here is 
an image of our initiation workflow in our repository. So we've put it in our institutional repository. It's available with a CC BY license. So anybody who wants can come and take this and adapt it for their own purposes, for their own institutional workflows. And we have a, sorry, my mouse has just disappeared. Um, it's available either at this URL or at with the DOI. So far, we've had 174 downloads um, of the document and just over 600 page views from interested parties. And with the academics we've spoken to about it, it's been generally considered to be quite helpful and it's demystified the process of working through these different requirements and also made it more accessible. So the actual workflow comes in two parts. The first part is a really, really simple overview. Um, and this, the idea behind this overview was that this could be used in teaching slides, but it could also be printed up as a postcard and distributed around the university. And basically we broke it down into three steps. First of all, do a data management plan, ideally using DMP online, but whichever process um, suits. And use your data management plan to work out what you want to do with your data. So satisfying university and funder requirements and any um, all the usual um, concepts that you, you plan for in a data management plan. Once you have your data management plan in place, you're then prompted to complete the appropriate data protection paperwork to establish what you're legally capable of doing with your data. And once you've got both of those um, procedures in place, you then seek ethical approval for all the planned uses of the data. Now, this came as quite a surprise to a lot of the academics that we spoke to about this because they're used to jumping in at three. They get their funding and they jump straight in at three, let's get the ethical approval in place. They often didn't write a data management plan at all. And as I said, they had their head in the sand over GDPR, so they weren't completing any of the paperwork that they needed to. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, so we broke it down into a three-stage process. The idea being that if you got the procedures in the correct order, you did not then have to go back and re-seek ethical approval with updates because you hadn't already allowed for a GDPR or um, the sharing that your funder expected of your data. Okay. What we also recommended was that if funding had not yet been granted for a project, researchers should try and get stage one and stage two in place before they apply for funding. So that when they apply for the funding, they've already got, they already know it's going to be legally possible to do what they want um, in their project. And then once the funding's in place, they go ahead and seek ethical approval. So this was just the outline um, workflow, but that in itself is not that useful because it sends you off to do all these things with no indication of where to find them. So we also produced a much more complex version, and I don't expect you to read all of this, um, actually linked out to all the different documents and the service email addresses that would be required to complete the process. It gives an indication of the timeframes required for um, some of the reviews and it's easily adjustable. So if new procedures come into place within the university, we can update it quite quickly and we've already had to do that once. So I think from if you remember from the view of the repository in the in the sorry the workflow in the repository, we already had a second version in there. So the process that we actually came up with was start here at the top, start by completing a data management plan, and we have a link there to a template for a data management plan, or it could link out to DMP online. Then there's an interchangeable section here, so the research information management team can review draft uh, DMPs. So if people want to check at that point that they're on the right um, road, they can send a draft of the data management plan to my team, we'll review it, send comments back to them. They then, if they're collecting personal information of any sort, they have to complete a data protection impact assessment, a DPIA. Now, I'm not sure if every university has this as a requirement, but at Glasgow, we've decided that all projects should have a DPIA. However, not all projects need to have their DPIA checked by the Data Protection Office. 
So the next point here is use our DPIA checklist and the information risk classification to check if the DPIA needs to be reviewed. So if the data is medium or low risk, a review is not required. And if the data or uh, data processing is high risk, researchers are required to send their DPIA to the Data Protection Office for review. The Data Protection Office is absolutely swamped. So this requires at least four weeks um, for the review to take place. And the workflow makes that clear so that researchers can build this into their process. Researchers, if they if they require a review, can then action any amendments requested by the Data Protection Office. Going down this other side of the checklist on the right, simultaneously to um, completing the DPIA, if the data is going to be shared externally from the university, the, P the PI also needs to um, complete a checklist for our contracts office and, if necessary, get the contacts team to prepare a data sharing agreement so that the data is shared legally with people outside the university. Then at this point, all of these pathways converge into um, the creation of the privacy notice. So again, we've got a link to our privacy notice templates and researchers are requested to modify it using information from the data management plan and the DPIA to prepare a privacy notice that's appropriate for the project. Once you're down to here, um, researchers are instructed to use the information in the data management plan, the DPIA and the privacy notice to complete the application for ethical approval and submit that to the appropriate ethics committee for um, review. It looks really complex, but our experience is that researchers have really liked this because it gives them a starting point. It takes them through a relatively straightforward path and it has links out to everything that they need to complete the process and feedback from the data protection office and from the ethics committees is that the applications that are coming through now are more complete and there's less need to go back to researchers to make sure that they've actually considered this okay so that is all i was actually going to present i thought we could probably use the rest of the time to discuss um, processes around um, this area. So this sort of early project initiation and setup. And I'm really interested to hear how other universities tackle this as well. Okay, so I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen. And does anyone have any questions or comments on this? Thank you so much, Mary. That looks fab, I have to say. Um, I'm impressed that you managed to pull everyone together. I know like, especially like legal offices and you said like your research uh, office that does data protection is swamped. So getting yeah. their attention to actually work on a workflow must have been Well, uh, actually hard. it was really rather easy to get them on board because oh. prior to this, any researcher that had been wondering about GDPR was just getting in touch with them directly. So they were getting a lot of inquiries for data that didn't really need an inquiry at all. So they were keen to slim down the amount of um, communication they were having to deal with, and this allowed them to do it. So they'd already published the DPIA checklist and the risk information risk classification on their website, but nobody was nobody kind of knew how to use that information and how it applied to different things. So getting it into this workflow and getting that out to researchers, I think, highlighted a lot of the information they'd already made public and it, I think it reduced their workflow slightly. Yeah that's a good point. Uh, mm. uh, a lot is like researchers not always knowing where where exactly the, the thing is that they are supposed to fill. So they just email instead of looking yeah. Yeah so pulling resources to get, uh, gather um, is, uh, is a really good point. So we have one yeah. question coming through. Have you considered using DMP online for the data uh, ethics form. So we haven't, Jenny, because they're owned by different teams within the university. So as I said, the Data Protection Office already had the DPIA forms on their web pages all set up. And the university has an online ethics application portal set up through our um, business systems portal. So people go into that login and then they can actually drill down to the appropriate ethics. So we have um, four college ethics committees, and then below those there's multiple school ethics committees. 
and different researchers apply to different ethics committees. And that's all controlled via the online portal. And I think DMP could not offer that degree of um, functionality for those forms. So I think just pulling it together in a central workflow and linking out to the different parts of it would, um, for us, would work better. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, DMP Online is not an ethics system. No, exactly. And most universities have an ethics system in place. So it's more yeah. just making sure we found an awful lot of these things. It's not actually um, the technical side is not the problem. A lot of people like to think that the technical side is the problem. The problem is actually policy. It's actually um, getting people to do the right thing at the right time. So procedures and policy. And then the technical side doesn't actually matter so much as long as you make it clear where things are. Julia asked if she could put her mic on to ask a question. Yes, please do. Hi, thank you for that. Sorry, I, I couldn't work out how to raise my hand. Um, so I work <laughs> in the research office at the University of Aberdeen. Um, yeah. And that was really interesting. So your your kind of detailed uh, workflow is actually, it looked quite, it reminded me of something that we've kind of come up, uh, come up with ourselves, but then didn't manage to implement just because of issues around our resourcing. And also, um, I suppose the one question I wanted to think about, I think you said that the first and the second stages would happen before before you go to a funder, so before you Ideally, so for a lot of funders, you need a data management plan in place anyway. Yeah, for, well, for some, yeah. But I guess where we've struggled is, um, given the funding success rate would be what 20%, 30%, yes. we're asking for quite a lot of additional uh, work from our investigators when most of the studies that they're putting in aren't going to get funded essentially. So a lot of what we're doing, with, we're thinking about trying to bring it in once we know a project's been funded. Yeah. I mean, we recommend ideally that the first two stages should have been considered prior to funding. I think the reality is that probably doesn't happen very often. But in the cases where a funder does require the data management plan, then this gets it done. But also, a lot of funders will pay for data management activities if they can be justified. But they can't be justified unless you've actually done some of this work already. So um, researchers could be missing out on the ability to bring in some funding to help with this if they haven't already considered it. And also, a lot of applications in the area of research that requires the collection of personal information are asking that your work is done in line with um, legislative requirements. And again, if researchers haven't done at least something around this, they can't actually answer that truthfully. So it's not additional work, it's just work that makes the application go smoother, I think. What's your compliance rate with your process? And presumably you've had to do a lot no of training. Idea kind of roll this out <laughs> yeah so we we don't we have no ability to check compliance rates on this um we have mandatory training for all of our science pgrs and it's strongly recommended for all of our arts uh humanities and social sciences pgrs um the simple form of the workflow is included in every training program that we run now so and um, we also have training available for staff several times a year so anyone attending this training will have seen the sort of simple postcard version we don't put up the full workflow because we don't want to scare people off they can you know they can access that once they're actually interested enough to click through but the the sort of headline postcard version goes into all of our training just to raise the awareness that this workflow exists that it's not terrifying that it is actually a process that's not too difficult to engage with and if they go looking for it they'll find it and there's help there on completing it and certainly since we've had it in place um the ethics committee that i sit on deals with animal data so we tend not to get too much there there are occasional um pgr uh, pg sorry gdpr issues with veterinary data but not very often so i can't tell from the ethics committee that i sit on how much this is helping but anecdotally from other ethics committees they are seeing an improvement in what's coming through 
And, and thanks very much. And just on the on the DSAs, on the data sharing agreements, uh, have I got you right that you would put those in place in every case? Or, I mean, in some instances, you may already have or be planning a collaboration agreement, which would kind of have a broader yes. scope. And so exactly. some, you may it's have just to make data sharing clauses within the collaboration agreement yep. rather than a separate DSA. So would that be, yeah? That would be fine. So the same contracts team deal with collaboration agreements and data sharing agreements. So they would know if they're already in con um, conversation with a group about a collaboration agreement, then yes, they could probably put the clauses in. But the one thing about GDPR is it's required not to be buried in other systems. So GDPR, certainly with the privacy notices, you can't bury them at the bottom of terms and conditions. They've got to be clear and sort of front and center. So we prefer them to be kind of dealt with separately. But um, there's no need for data sharing agreement if all the work is going to be done in house, but it's kind of highlighting to researchers maybe using a transcription service that if they're using that, they need a data sharing agreement because that's moving it outside the university. And sort of very simple methods that they've maybe used for a long time and didn't require data sharing agreements previously do now. And the other thing we really, really highlight to students and staff is that if they have this data on, for example, their university OneDrive and they go home to the States, they can't download this data because that's moving it outside the EU. So it's being very, very careful about where the jurisdiction within which the data is held, because the minute they go home and download that data, they've moved it outside the EU. That also requires GDPR um, consideration. So all these elements kind of get raised as part of this, and it just helps, I think, generally improve awareness. Thank you. That was like a super interesting conversation that I think like ticked a lot of the boxes of the complicated things. Yeah, I so I guess... Angus yeah, has asked, could there be exchange of information between the systems, for example, to avoid rekeying? Angus, we would love this to happen. Um, unfortunately, as I said, our research, our ethics approvals or ethics application system is one system. We have data management plans in DMP online, but also elsewhere. And the Data Protection Office just works on um, word forms. So we don't have that degree of joined upness at the moment and um, I can't see it happening anytime soon. We'd really, really like for a data management plan to become part of the ethics approval process. That would be our gold star because it would get it done. Um, but data pr so far, um, the ethics committees are not interested. They can't see the value. That's interesting. That, that would have been my question if all the other documents that you have in this workflow then at least get like in, attached and this is one package that goes to ethics. But that's yeah, an our ethics, one. yeah, our ethics committee, um, we worked with them over the last five years on this now and they have allowed us to put new mandatory questions into the ethics application system. But that's as far as they've let us go. And it took quite a bit of persuasion to convince them that these questions were necessary. So questions about um, data retention, future sharing, consent for that. It's interesting, uh, have, that's have that's the researchers, oh, sorry, Angus, go ahead. Uh, I'm just saying thanks. Uh, I've, I've had a another question which is maybe a bit more left field even than in that point which is um i mean dmps at the moment are confidential documents by default unless someone chooses to to share them mm -hmm. um given that that's happening more and there's more interest in that and that dmps have to describe what steps are being taken to make data secure is there any um, thought towards the DMP itself being treated as a potential disclosure risk? We, so I guess we take a slightly different stance on this. Um, we advise researchers to only include very high level information in their data management plans. 
So if it's information about how they're complying with um, data protection or um, how they're storing their data securely, we tend to advise if they're doing it in line with university policy, just to say that and they can link out to the policy rather than having specifics in their data management plan. Um, I would actually like to see data management plans made documents of public record. I think they should be openly available. I think they put down an early marker for how people intend to run their research. And certainly in America, research um, funders are publishing the data management plans of successful applications. And I think that's a good thing. Um, we've actually had some conversation about whether they should go in our institutional repository. But we're nowhere near there yet. I think that's probably too big an over a hurdle to overcome at the moment. But that's the direction I'd like to see it moving. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? James kindly has pointed out that there is a, an opportunity to provide provide a input in a ICO survey on the role of data ethics in complying with GDPR. So that um, if some of you have time before the end of this year, that probably would be a good opportunity um, yeah, for, I, the, I didn't watch for the outcome. Mm -hmm. That seems an interesting one. Yeah. And the links further down in the chat. Don't know if there are more questions. If not, I see. Oh, like, yeah, issues with DMPs and freedom of information. Making a making... Um, Is this something, James, is this something you've already had experience with? Has it happened? Um, no, no, it's not. But I'm just, I, we deal with freedom of information. I'm just thinking that if we start disclosing data management plans, it's going to open up a freedom of information, um, you know, you know, can of worms on the people who are, who are dealing with freedom of information and that they'll want to see, you know, all copies of all the data management plans and they'll, and they'll you know, and we'll end up getting, you know, FOI bombed with um, FOI requests on um, on um, data, data, you know, on 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 data management plans. Um, yeah. And just going, and just going back to your point, of course, there's a big difference in the you know in the US where they don't have data protection legislation to actually demonstrate that they are looking after the data safely. You know, that, yes. that's obviously a big plus in 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 disclosing data management plans. I can really see the advantage of doing that in trying to. Um, you know, recruit volunteers to clinical trials and everything else, saying about look, you know, your data is going to be made safe. While as over here, in you know, in Europe and the UK, we've we've got the protection under the um, yes. data protection. Automatic. Yeah, the one thing I think we always highlight with regard to freedom of information is that, in terms of research data that's been publicly yeah. funded, that yeah. data potentially could be subject to a freedom of information request yeah, and if yeah. it's in a repository that takes that away because you can just direct them towards the repository yeah no, but just, yeah but i was thinking more about sort of you know the activists of people like that you know the the yes um you know the people you know the, the, the you know people who quite rightly you know want to want to sort of ban animal testing and everything else would just use mm. this as a way to get more information uh, uh, you know uh, uh, about it so yeah. That's why I'm just, those, you know, I'm just, I'm just a little bit concerned. You, 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 you know, you've got the issue of trying to be open, but then yeah. you, you, you know, you've got the issue of them using it as a, you know, campaigning tool to actually, you know, to actually stop, you know, to to actually stop medical research. Yeah, technically, there's nothing to stop them at the moment requesting them, other than the fact they may not know that they exist. Well, exactly. That's my point. <laughs> um, I think. I don't know. I think making the ones that can be open open is better. Yeah. And then I think no, you've got you. there are reasons under GDPR while the uh, reasons under freedom of information why the other ones can't be disclosed. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, they, I mean they are already subject potentially to that request. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. As you it's say, but it's just, yeah, but it's just restricted 
collected at the moment that it's mostly tends to be you know sort of other academic researchers who who, who know about the, the you know the repositories who are interested in the research yes. rather than, um you know campaigning yeah. groups but yeah as Angus said other funders in the Europe are starting to expect that they will be disclosed so yeah yeah well then, as you say, the answer is, is then to make them is then to go back and then just make them, as you're saying, you know, very, high you know, level. very, very high level, very high level. Yeah. I think certainly that's the approach we take. We we request that no personal or sensitive information is included in a data management mm. plan, either mm. about sort of intellectual property within the project, specifics yeah. of intellectual property within the project, or about participants. Mm. Um, yeah, that's how we approach it at the moment. I, th I believe they can still be useful documents without going into too much mm. detail. Mm. Very interesting, though, that there could be a, a, a conflict between uh, that um, uh, desire to make the DMP open and it, and it being useful and serve the, the, the purpose of you know uh making sure that the proper steps are, are being t t taken i suppose that, uh, uh, from the ethics point of view the ethics process is checking that anyway yes um, but yeah i guess well the ethics ethics process only checks part of it i mean most ethics processes aren't really looking at a lot of the processes that data management plans are looking at so there's there's overlap but i wouldn't say that they um check everything but, but yes so, so the dmp support needs to check the other the other parts yes. are actually uh being done in the kind of detail that's that's required even if it's not actually reflected in the dmp itself Yes, absolutely. Or the, the sensitive bits aren't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I think that like that was a really good discussion, and I think we've probably touched about every aspect and every possible document <laughs> that could play a role. Uh, now, thank you so much, Mary. That was uh, was really interesting, and I think You're like, yeah that ethics workflow is, is something that still a lot of institutions grapple with so um, yeah. I'll see uh, will be interesting to see how um, some pick this up and and copy what you are doing because it well, looks really good please feel free to just take it and adapt it rather than reinventing the wheel because yeah that's what we're trying to help with okay great thank you um, yeah. I'll go on to a few updates from us as a team uh, now. There, there aren't that many. We're getting close to the end of 2020. Um, so just a, a few reminders from the team that um, we'll, picking, we'll be picking up the DMP online demo sessions again in January um, with uh, looking at the um, functionality to um, add additional administrative and the various roles and um, um, uh, permissions that you can give to your colleagues there. I'll put the link in the chat for that one. Um, you should have received our November uh, newsletter. Um, there won't be any uh, one in, in December, but I, I, I was told you'd get a, a nice um, holiday card in your inboxes uh, at some point in the next days. Um, recordings from the previous uh, drop-in sessions are, are available on YouTube, um, so I can put that in the uh, I'll put that in the chat as well in a second. Um, and I think the other bit of use is that um, we've um, managed to sign a memorandum of understanding uh, with fair sharing. Um, that might be of an like so might be a service that some of you have heard, which is basically a registry of metadata standards, repositories, uh, and things like that. So um, we're looking at integrating with them in 2021. Um, 
and that again will be like one step, one opportunity to move um, a bit closer to machine actionable DMPs. Um, so that's news that will go out um, and be advertised a bit wider, uh, hopefully later today if I manage. Um, so that's another thing that will be coming and then in, in January you'll, you'll hear more about like a, a proper map and what we plan to do in 2021. So we'll try to put that together so um, you know what to expect when. Um, I think you all should have received uh, um, messages from Magdalena about um, Brexit paperwork. Um, those of you who are outside the UK um, at least um, uh, some model clauses that um, will cover um, in case there's a no-deal Brexit. I have to admit I per personally lost a little bit of track where the negotiations are at the moment because it's just um, so wild and uh, changing every day but we'll, we're, we're monitoring and we'll check with our legal team to make sure that that's um, all in hand for um, our our colleagues who stay in the European Union, that, that all is covered. Um, uh, another quick note that um, we might need to send some updated links to um, for the drop-ins next year. So the University of Edinburgh has now bought um, a Zoom license and you've seen that some of our sessions we've been running in Zoom uh, already. So um, that means we might um, switch over from go to meeting to zoom um on on the for for all the meetings on a more regular basis or some other system that the university has a subscription to so uh, just keep your eyes open for uh, any upcoming meetings in case there's a, there's a change in the connection link and i think that's everything that i had on the list of announcement so unless there are like questions from you to us as the team i would say thank you everyone for joining us today thank you especially to to mary for presenting uh, thank you for being a wonderful community and 2020 uh, and um, I hope to see you all again uh, next year in one of our meetings and hope you all have some time uh, in the next few weeks to to recover a bit from this pandemic year and take some time off and recharge. I think I've posted all the links now uh, in the chat if not you'll get that in a in a follow-up meeting so thank you everyone um, have a good day and see you again next year <laughs>